So, tell me something terrible. How's your uh, heat lamp over there? Great. You look like an iguana. Oh, thank you. That's thank my goal. I'm you. actually a lizard person. Yeah. Yeah. We should do one on lizard people. We should. I don't know much. I don't know. I don't know their backstory. Um. Oh. I, the, I don't like. I know like they're like the role they play. I suppose in pop culture and like relative to to, to, to today. They're an alien. I. I just want to make sure you know. <laughs> I know that much. Okay. Are you sure? I just don't know. Like. I don't know their origin story, I suppose. I mean, sure, we can do that, I guess. I know their bullet points. If you really want to, like... <laughs> Drum up the conspiracy theory? <laughs> yeah, wade into those waters. I guess we can address aliens. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's terrible, yeah. right? We did do an episode on that one guy in England who uh, got kidnapped by aliens. Abducted oh, by like aliens. Oh, the trash pile or whatever? Uh-huh. Yeah. I remember the weird, mysterious it. goo that they don't know where it came from. I feel like at this point... Oh, that was so long ago. If you told me... A, like, if you... <laughs> Redid did an topic. episode? <laughs> yeah. Like, if you redid episode four, whatever that was, I would be like, oh, I've never heard this. Like, oh, I'm... shit. No, I, I, that was episode three. Episode three was um, tuberculosis. What was episode four? I don't know. Episode two is Machine Gun Sheriff. I only know that because people <laughs> listen to that and uh, Cleveland Superbomb. A lot. Yeah. They get through the first two and they're like, no, no. Uh, and bum- give up. <laughs> no, it bums me out because episode two, the audio sucks. It does. So, like, hopefully they press on to episode three. My mic was so so low in episode two. We're figuring it out. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just try to be better about talking into the mic. The problem is I and get too chill. The, the problem is I get too chill and I get like relaxed and I slowly just fade back because I have to actively have good posture to actually talk into the mic. Ugh. Which, yeah, you have the cr- cool mic arm now and I don't. Oh, back no. when I had the cool mic arm, I could just be like relaxed. Now I have to actively... I have to, like, I'll hang back when you start reading, and then I have to, like, sit up to talk. Sometimes I don't always make that move. It's it's that time of year, guys, so Christmas presents. Should we give them our P.O. box if they want to send us some goodies? <laughs> like no. a mic arm? We have two mic arms. I just use one for playing video games with my friends. Oh, God. Hey, if we got a third mic, I wouldn't always have to bring this one up here. Oh, uh, that's an idea. We're thinking about guest pods in the future, upgrading mm-hmm. our equipment. Yes. It's hard to justify these purchases. Speaking of which, you should become a Patreon if you're not already. <laughs> For a dollar a month, you <laughs> get to listen to him talk most of the time. Yeah. One, three, or five dollars a month. And at five dollars a month, you get a pin. Yep. And our undying gratitude. We'll hand deliver it. I don't care where you live. <laughs> Excuse to drive to California. Bucket, we're flying to our German listener. Yes. I'm telling you right now. Yep. We will hand deliver you a pin. We will. And then ask to stay the night. <laughs> <laughs> Awkward, but okay. Um, I saw, not German, but Scottish, our gin for the evening is from Scotland. Ooh. Yeah. Our gin that destroyed the inside of our shot glass. Okay. I don't know what happened. This is Hendrix Lunar Gin. It's pretty good. Definitely have to dilute it down with a mixer. Uh-huh. It is very strong. And we poured it in a shot glass that we got at the zoo that has penguins on the inside. Because we're parents. We've used it before. It's never been a problem. Going through the dishwasher. Yeah. Never, never been a problem. Poured this Hendrix 45 almost percent gin in it, dumped it out, saw like a little fleck of something, so I wiped off the penguin and it smeared the entire penguin. So uh-huh. it's pretty much paint thinner. The moral of the story is I think they're lying about that 45%. No, it might be right. It's just mm-hmm. who knew? Who knew? And I tweeted at them angrily that they owe me a shot glass. They never tweeted back, so pretty. This is it. This is the breakthrough. The breakthrough? Yep, they're going to come back with something witty and we're just going to go viral. That is <laughs> very much uh, unlikely. No. Anywho, what's this week's topic? Wait. What? I'm Tiffany. Oh, I'm Scott. And you're listening to Tell Me Something Terrible. Yeah, you are. Look at you, remembering things. I was just ready to, re- you know. Dive in. Well, it's late. I've had a lot of gin. So, mm-hmm. was hoping. You know, eventually. We can... Mm-hmm. We can Ease into it here. Uh, well, you got a lot of ham behind you still. I just I do and the desk. spicy cheese. Yeah. Would you like Wickedly some ham and spicy her. cheese? No, I don't think it would play well on the the mic. You're gonna sit on the table yep. anyway. Mm-hmm. Okay. I might eat some ham. Fade off into the distance. Okay. Thank you so much. Or he's passed out. I could be. The dog already is. Anyway, All right. what's the topic? Um, we're gonna bring it back to Michigan. As we do. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, so we're going to kick off the holiday season with a real uh, with a real Michigan Christmas tragedy. Okay. Oh, can I shamelessly plug real quick? Yeah, go for it. I do um, like a shameless plug. This episode coming out Tuesday, obviously. So is the Patreon episode because it's just a tradition now. It's tradition around here, as I they say in Hot Ones, which we watch all the time. Um <laughs> That it comes out on the last day of the month. So you're going to get this one. And if you're a patron, all of you, um, <laughs> you will get the bonus episode, which is not Michigan. I'm doing two Savannah, Georgia crimes. Ooh, I yeah. do like Georgia. Do you? You might not. <laughs> They're like, they both are like flirting around 1900. So there's nice racial undertones. It's oh, great. Oh, good. We've done a few of those. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I didn't mean for it to be, but you can't really not have it be. Same here. Same here. Okay, cool. Let's let's bring it to the north and yeah. make everyone uncomfortable. Yep. Yep. Um, this one wasn't based off of the color of your skin. It was more because like you didn't speak English. Oh. Yeah. We barely speak English. So that's fine. <laughs> Most Americans don't. Yep. So do. See. Do, don't. Don't. Do not. <laughs> Incapable of speaking proper English. Mm-hmm. Um. So we're gonna take it all the way back to uh, July of 1913. Okay. Yep. So. I wasn't born yet. No. No. This is a hundred years before our child was born. Yep. Okay. Cool. Yep. So we're taking it to the town, the company town of Calumet, nestled in Keweenaw Peninsula in the UP. I feel like I've heard of Calumet. I don't know why I would have. It's a small town now, but Keweenaw is like a big wine country in the UP. Like Leelanau? Mm-hmm. Kind of like similar... Is it? I think so. Or did you just word associate it? No, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure I've seen Q and on wine You're bottles. Like, they're like the same word, just with one different letter. It's Native American. It's in the UP. It's all pretty much the same. Okay. Let's do it. So this is smack dab in the middle of what was dubbed copper country. So mining for metal was the most dangerous kind of mining. And then mining for copper was the most dangerous metal to mine. Fun fact. My bonus episode is going to include copper. Oh, my God. The serendipity. The original plan was to record them both tonight, but that ain't going to happen. Someone. Anyway. Sorry. Too much so this won't make sense unless you listen to the bonus one. So tune in, homies. Mm-hmm. Did you just watch me throw something randomly across the room? I did. I picked it up my toes. I have no idea what it was. Uh, it looks like the middle of your pen cap. Whatever it is. Keep going. Um, anyway. We're in Keweenaw in Cal- Calumet. In Copper Country in northern yep. Michigan. See you. In the UP. So. See you is the scientific symbol for copper. It was, sorry. Is it? Yeah. Okay. It's like Kubrick in Latin. It's copper. Sure. Cool. <laughs> Talk nerdy to me. <laughs> <laughs> no. So in 1840s, a geological team arrived in northern Michigan, found the na- that the Native Americans in this region could simply find copper, like in the forests and the rivers, all willy nilly truck driver. <laughs> And they just thought, laying about. Yes. So they also um, saw the quality and the qua- of the ore and decided that this was the highest quality ever in the entire world and that they needed to mine the ore lines there. I'm pretty sure if I started a mining company, I would call it call it either ore. No, no, no. I think that's a really good name for <laughs> it. It is a very good name. Yeah. Either ore. <laughs> it is a very good name. Yeah. Copper, gold, either ore. Mm-hmm. Good. Good marketing. Yep. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so they decided they needed to mine Northern Michigan. So we have the, enter the Calumet and Hecla Mining Company. They settled into an already existing uh, company town called Red Jacket, which was later dubbed, um, Calumet, and they brought in cheap immigrant workers. At the time, the workforce mostly consisted of Germans, Irish, and the British, um, this is a group of people known for their skills in mining across the seas. So they were like, these are skilled workers. We know they're not afraid of this really hard, awful work. That's super dangerous. They do it all the time. So when surveying an area, unskilled workers were used to break the ground and digging at the surface. If enough ore was found, then shafts were drilled going down 100 to 200 feet. Okay. Okay. And as demand for copper grew, Calumet and Hecla became one of the world's largest co- copper mining companies. Men would work 10 you plus... world's largest? World's. Hmm, yes. Okay. Yep. Michigan was like the leader in copper mining. Okay. For a very long time. Like Nevada was silver? Mm-hmm. So, really? It's called the silver state, I assume. I don't know. Oh, well, yeah, that's a pretty good assumption, I suppose. Why else would it be the silver state? <clears throat> 
I don't know all the people that retire there. What? S- their silver hair? No. <laughs> Look, it's a stretch. That's a sunshine state in Florida. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so um, these workers, they would work 10 plus hours a day, six days a week. And skilled workers, um, they made $3 a day, which is approximately $83 in today's money. So about eight thirty an hour doing hard manual deadly labor. Okay, cool. Cashiers make that. Yep. Like just standing there. <laughs> yep. <laughs> not working minds. <laughs> nope. Where you could die. And at there's any definitely moment. no overtime in these six hour work. <laughs> Absolutely not. It didn't no. matter if you worked six hours or 16 hours. It was $3 a day if you were a skilled worker. If you were an unskilled work- worker, you were lucky enough to get paid like just under $2 a day. Wait, I thought you said $83 a day. So, oh, in with today's, inflation. Today's, today's. Yes. Okay. So, like $2 a day is like about 55 bucks a day. Um, Gotcha. Working okay. minds. Yep. No, mm-hmm. You calculated. I got you. Yep. Try to be, try to perspective. It's important. Yeah. Um, so men usually worked in teams of two to three workers, drilling, watching out for their teammates and chipping at the mine walls in total darkness, just like the caves okay. that we've been in where there's like literally nothing. Yeah. Like you just, you blow out the candle and you can't see squat. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of drilling in the dark. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Sorry. Keep the light off. That was, we're in our thirties. That was the most appropriate joke I could come up with. Okay. <laughs> you had teams of two to three dudes. It could have got way worse than what you act like that. Okay. Like <laughs> just accept that is the best joke I could say. <laughs> we're trying to keep it slightly higher than PG thirteen right now. <laughs> yeah, we don't want this like to be NC seventeen or whatever. That you know the rating of what's above R is that NC seventeen? Okay, yes, yeah. and then and then triple X. Is it? There's not, isn't there a single X? I don't know. Okay. I was just, there might be a single X. Do they rate movies still? Yes. Or do they just make them for TV and then make them for anyway? I don't know. Twenty twenty's had an effect on on like entertainment, hasn't it? Yeah. It doesn't matter. Okay, go back to these dudes drilling in the dark. So these du- these dudes drilling in the dark, um, they would work in teams of two to three in total darkness with only one to two candles light to work in. I like the mood lighting for ten hours. Ooh, <laughs> or wow! More. Look at the longevity of these guys. <laughs> yeah, these candles—they just keep going and going. They're I mean, like energizing bunnies. Something <laughs> so, earning that three dollars a day. <laughs> that Viagra is really working. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> um, and then also on top of that, many of the workers were waist deep in water, trying not to fall down shafts. Mm, okay. Mm-hmm. So it was common for accidents to happen, ones that left people maimed or worse dead yeah death yeah. that's the worst <laughs> yeah. i believe yep um, i don't know i think i would pro- i would think it, i'd rather just die than be like maimed in the late 1800s Both is always an option yeah <laughs> um be maimed and then die like two months later yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah of like sepsis that sounds awful yep um so death in the mines was par for the course with an average of one death per week which equates to about one out of 200 men working in the mines that died okay that's a lot. Just this mine. <clears throat> Not all of them. But this is the world's largest. This is the world's largest. Okay. Just this mine. But still. At the time, it's the world's largest. An long. exceptional amount of men. Yeah. Once per yeah. week's a lot. Yeah. This is not account all of them throughout the country. We were like, okay, well, maybe if there's like 50,000 mines, that's not so bad. No. This is this one mine. Um, And it was usual that injured... So every week, it's we've had been four days since someone died on the work site. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, so it was usual that injured or dead workers were left until the end of the working shift before. It's a lot of manpower to get the dead body out of the mine, you know? Yeah. Just throw them on top of the cart when you're heading up for the day. Uh huh. Is that what they did? <laughs> so they would wait for the med carts to come down at the end of their shift to throw oh, nice. the, the injured c- who's laying there suffering for hours with no pain. Nice. Yeah. You know, and, and then. Next and then, to the canary. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, and then, and then they would wheel them up at the end of the shift. Okay. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it happened like 15 minutes in or like 15 hours in. It's a real Frito-Lay situation. (laughs) Yes, it is. Don't eat Frito-Lay, guys. Well, do your own research. (laughs) Little sketch. Anyway. (laughs) Anyway. We're not about that podcast. We can do some, tell me something terrible and just read headlines like every week. (laughs) No, no. There needs to be some context to headlines. No, I know. One, we would get you super fired up. Oh, I dropped that bobby (laughs) pin. Anyway, keep oh, going. No, speaking of super powered up or fired up, you dropped my bobby pin. <laughs> that you dropped up here probably five episodes ago. Probably. So they would have to wait for the carts to come up um, to bring them up once they've either died or been injured. 
Uh, don't bring your toes up on my paper, <laughs> okay, weirdo. Um, and death could happen from falling timbers, uh, their own hand tools, explosives, hauling accidents, machinery, electricity, falling down a chute or a shaft, or drilling accidents. And the biggest, because the drills were two men operated at the time, you had to have two men operating the drills, and you had someone else watching, so you at least had someone there to like be like, oh shit, they're hurt. Okay. Um, Like a buddy system. Buddy! So the biggest concern... That's not our first heavyweights reference on this podcast. When was, oh, when was the first one? I don't know, I just know it's not. Do you feel skinny, Tony? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so the biggest concern and the biggest killer was falling rocks. That makes sense. Yeah. So you could just get knocked out and like half your brains on the floor, but you're not dead yet, but have to wait another 10 hours before someone comes to collect you. Gotcha. Great. Yeah. Or you're just under a pile of rocks and they can't see you at all. Y- yeah. Like your fingers are still twitching. We got a live one. That's Sorry. creepy. That was bad. Um, <laughs> so, so as Calumet and Hecla grew, the town expanded to hundreds of acres above ground and 7,000 feet below. That seems like a lot. Mm-hmm. Wait, 7,000 like straight down feet? Straight down. That's pretty deep, yo. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. That's over a mile. Yep. It's like a mile and a quarter, two thirds, a uh, third. It's a lot. It's like a 2K. I'm just, <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Our listener, listeners across the pond, can you do the math for us? Thanks. I was saying 6,000-ish feet like 2K. Is it? Sure. 2,000 yards. Sure. Meters-ish. Sure. Anyway. <laughs> so um, Calumet housed all of the workers, which did take some sting out of the low wages and unsafe working conditions because they did apply them amenities and houses. Okay. But that's, not enough to like... something. Sure. It's Except they room. they owned everything, and you didn't get paid enough that if something were to happen, you couldn't save up enough money that if you were to get displaced, you had nowhere to go because there was nothing. Gotcha. That's like, did you ever hear the song "I Owe My Soul to the Company Store"? No. No. Okay, it's an old song from like the fifties, and the premise is that um, that. They paid you a wage, and then in order to get you any... You turned around and paid it to the store. To the to... store. Except the problem is that the stuff at the store costs more than what the wage you were getting, so you would wind up owing the store money, so you would be in debt getting a pay, getting paid a wage that wasn't enough to even buy your groceries in the first place. And so the song is, I owed my soul to the company store. No? All right. Cool. I grew up listening to, like, vintage country. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm also not a baritone. I'm You're also not? tone deaf. You're not a baritone? <laughs> no, I'm not. When your balls drop, it'll all come around. I did play a baritone. Did you? Yeah, I did. Wow. <laughs> Tell facts. me more. Oh, oh, this is what I've been waiting for. <laughs> so this one time at band camp, just kidding, it's really nothing like that. Okay. It's actually awful. Um, So uh, the CN- CNH, uh, Calumet and Hecla, owned... Um, everything so they owned the school where they taught future generations not um only just specifically only how to work in the mines so kids like a trade school yeah except you had no other option mandatory trade school yeah it wasn't like here's basic math and also how you use a drill it's like this is the only thing you know yeah um so they were literally starting to train like the next gen yes to come up and only the only ability is going to be able to work in these mines Uh uh-huh that's applicable, I guess. <laughs> this incident um, shaped a lot of what happened in America later, like labor, like child labor laws. Okay. Yeah. Good. Some resolve. <laughs> yes. At the very least. <clears throat> no. Uh, I mean, it took like a century, but you know, whatever. Um, anyway, um, they owned the churches, they owned the stores, they owned the library, they owned the houses, and um, the company could kick you out for any reason whatsoever with only a 15 days notice didn't matter what it was if they decided they wanted to kick you out of the house you were gone the house or the like your job and everything your job and everything that's probably a good thing yeah nope (laughs) um unless you were fired or like if you died and then they would then they had the right to kick you out or your widow and fan or your widow and family immediately there was no, like, we give you 15 days to pack up your shit and get out. They were like, hey, your husband died. Peace. Oh, that's encouraging. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Uh huh. Heartwarming. Yep. Uh, separate from this, I remember listening. To, I've listened to quite a few like history podcasts regarding um, company towns and stuff. A lot of women. There was a big underground trade for women uh-huh. and like groceries and housing. So a lot of women were. Um, Doing what they could to feed their family. Gotcha. Uh huh. Like before their husband died or after? Both. Okay. Mm hmm. Yep. Yeah. If they couldn't make ends meet, they just go to the local bar to a little room where there's just a group of men. Mm. Uh huh. To pay off their debts. <laughs> okay. It's fine. Is it? Nope. Doesn't seem fine. <laughs> uh, that's a side tangent. Um. So at the as the turn of the century approached, uh. Agency became one of the world's largest suppliers of coppers. Copper. They're, nope, they're, coppers. <laughs> yes, coppers. So their need for unskilled workers and skilled workers increased. So the company started bringing in workers from different countries, such as Croatia, Italy, and Finland. Most of the workers were Finland, Finnish. Um, oh, they had to get the job done. <laughs> yes, they did. So uh, these workers spoke less English and were considered less skilled than other workers. And so because these workers were what well, was considered... Well, they didn't go to mining school, of course. <laughs> clearly. So because these workers were considered like a lesser race, um, because they didn't speak English, they were given the job of um, tammers, which after like doing some cursory research to find out exactly what tammers did i think it might have actually been tampers but i don't really want to listen through like all of the documentaries that i'd listened to uh-huh. to like re-listen to our <laughs> shitty like midwestern accent <laughs> to determine whether or not that's what they said there's a p in the word or not yeah so um tampers are like the people that take like dynamite and like tamp it down with rods kind of like the the guy who lobotomized himself on an accident okay. like that uh-huh. um or if it is Tammers, I did see a little blip about like they're underground miners, like underwater miners. So they might be the people that are like going down and trying to like tamp in dynamite underwater. Huh. Either way. Not, not 100%. Not a great job. It's the absolute worst job with the absolute worst pay. Perfect combo. Yes. Because they took these quote unquote American lesser. Dream. Yes. And they took these lesser citizens, stopped them when they got off the boat and said, hey, we got a job for you, brought them back to Michigan and made them do the worst job in the worst mining situation. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, Cause they were lesser cause they didn't speak English. Naturally. Yep. Um, so by 1930, 1930- sarcasm, sometimes it's hard to tell me. <laughs> sometimes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You make sure you clarify that. <laughs> yes, yeah. So by 1913, strikes had started and been successful all over the country at this point, starting out west, where there was a growing support, uh, there was a growing copper mining industry in the west that was using more efficient mining techniques, which wound up leaving agency behind. So people were worried about the profitability of the mining companies in Michigan because they were using like outdated technology. They were the deepest um, mines. They were quote unquote the least profitable. Which doesn't matter. They still had millions and millions of dollars. Yeah. Um, Comparatively, though. Uh, Perspective. Yeah. It's important. That's oh, what you told me. <laughs> yeah, totally. Especially when you have like, oh, no, we're making 60% profit and somebody else is making 61%. Ugh, we're falling behind. Yeah. Um, Pay the finish less. Yes. Good. <laughs> so uh, agency was starting to experience smaller profit margins and so now this enters the single man drill. So this was, I think it was 1906, I believe, when it was invented. And the, the workers starting putting t- started putting two to two together. A single manned drill meant that they didn't need two men to work the drills anymore. That's good math. Mm-hmm. Which meant that a company that was starting to bleed out and had uh, lowered profits felt like they needed to downsize the workplace. Yeah. So the, the workers were like, oh, we're going to lose, half of us are going to lose our jobs Mm -hmm. because efficiency is the only place that this company feels like they can increase their profit margin with. In order to do that, they were going to half the work, um, the workforce. Yep. Yep. Which in turn would result in even less safe work environments because now you no longer have the buddy system. So if someone gets hurt, you're on your own. There's no one like telling anybody that you're hurt. Yeah, they'll find you eventually. Yeah, like two, three days later, uh, once your candle's burned out. Yeah. 
Um, in fact, one boss, one mine boss was famously quoted by saying um, he didn't make his mines safer because timber costs me money and men cost me nothing. If that gives you an idea of how they valued um, their employees. Their perspective. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's shitty. Yeah. yeah. So enter the West Federation of Miners, which is an organization, an organized union known for their militant strategy. Albeit that reputation was only earned from like exaggerated newspaper reports, which we obviously know nothing about. Nope. Nope. Can't relate. Mm -mm. So after developing a union and successfully fighting for workers' rights out West, the WFM came up to the UP and talks of unionizing started. At first, James McNaughton, the head of the agent of agency, um, Oh, sorry, C&H. I've been putting agency. It's definitely Calumet and Hecla. Whatever. The you company. Can, you can interchange It that. doesn't matter. I'm not offended. The shitty company. Yep. Um, he wasn't worried. Convinced that uh, such a diverse workforce with different values and languages were not capable of organizing. But the WFM hired union workers that spoke every language and handed out flyers in every language of the workforce. So they were organized. Yes, they were. Okay. They've already done successful unionizing campaigns. They were like, we're doing it here. Right. So 15,000 mine workers signed up to be part of the union. And then on July 14th, 1913, the union started their strike. 9,000 members strong, asking for better safety conditions and the ability to air grievances without being fired. What a concept. Yep. That was the only thing they asked for. They're just like, we just don't want to be fired if we have a problem. We want safer working conditions yep and that was it okay they didn't ask for money at that point literally no okay nah just how we don't un- want to die how unreasonable we don't want to be fired <laughs> yeah yeah um and so they did this in the form of an official letter that was set on mcnaughton's desk and mcnaughton was pissed mcnaughton refused to meet with a union leader whose name was charles mcmoyer or any one part of the union organization for that matter saying quote if I sit down and talk to them, then I am admitting that they have the right to exist. Denial is super powerful. <laughs> it is. Um, so McNaughton's tactics didn't include negotiating with a bunch of what he considered un-American socialists out to destroy the American way of life. These assholes. <laughs> There's got to be good McNaughton pun- puns just running amok through the mind, too. <laughs> He's McNaughton even thinking about it. Sorry, that was terrible. That was bad. Thank you. Welcome to the podcast. Yep, that's your <laughs> you introduction. Wait, you waited that long for a bad dad joke. <laughs> yep, that's pretty good. We made it 27 minutes in. Proud of you. <laughs> so um, the union workers started holding strike walls, rallies, and demonstrations, attempting to physically block people from working. Um, and this wound up working. Like, they stopped people from going to work. They shut down the mines the day they started their their strike, and the mines were shut down until that fall. So C and H wanted the strike. All that the company wanted the strike to last just long enough for workers to feel that financial burden of not having an income. They're yeah. like, we want them to suffer just long enough to be like, this is a mistake. We're never going to make again. Yep. So next, C&H had hired fresh off-the-dock immigrants, about 3,000 of them, to make up for the 9,000 that were striking. Yep. So they're making up for three people's work for those poor... With good, fresh, uh, inexperienced people. Yep. It's fine. Yep. Um, so they hired them through a hiring company that stopped them as soon as they got off the dock, like got off the boat, telling them that they had jobs for them in Michigan and that the company, that hiring company, would pay for their travel as long as the workers paid them back once they got there so these poor people not only they're working three people's jobs they also walked into their job in debt it's a good good philosophy what how much do you think capitalism is working for us now perfect (laughs) flawless system the whole thing so it's not capitalism it's greed there's a difference whatever yeah um so union organizer uh her name was big annie clemens I don't. It's like Big Annie Clemens. She's a union organizer. It's like Fat Amy from Pitch Perfect. <laughs> My real name's Patricia. Patricia yeah. <laughs> so Big Patricia Annie Clemens. She was a Croatian woman. She organized. Of course she was. <laughs> she she organized most of the rallies, 
Most organizers were actually women, and then children marched in the streets. So this is a very much like family-oriented situation. Yep. So police started to react violently to the marchers in the streets. One time, they pulled the American flag Big from- Big Annie kicks some ass, let's be honest. She does. Does she? Good. Yeah. Big Annie, Big Patricia Annie, <laughs> when they tried to snatch the American flag from her, she straight up essentially told them uh, in return that they would have to kill her to make her stop marching. It was pretty much like, you're going to have to pry this flag from my dead hands in the streets. Nice. Sort of like sentiment. You got to love that Croatian standing up for, you know, for the flag. <laughs> yeah, she's not fucking around. Uh, so union opposers were appalled by the women and children's behaviors at rallies, all this cussing and shouting. <gasps> How improper of them. <laughs> they probably didn't wear their corsets either. <gasps> Did they show some, some ankle? <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> and so in return... The protesters slash strikers would stick the ends of their brooms in outhouses. <laughs> I was like, wait, where are they putting them? <laughs> Inside of toilets. Okay. And then they would smear them <laughs> on the counter protesters <laughs> and the strike breakers that were sent in. Aggressive move. <laughs> Shit sticks for everyone. <laughs> Unfortunately, we can't name this one Shit Sticks. Damn it. <laughs> So, Stupid Facebook rules. So, um, of course, things were escalating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, scared of the blatant threat to <laughs> retaliate with violence if an agreement wasn't reached, um, Calumet and Hecla uh, contacted the governor, who then called in the National Guard under the guise of maintaining law and order. Okay. Sounding familiar yet? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Um, Who's the governor of Michigan in 19-whatever? <clears throat> this one was 1913. Okay. Yeah. So I guess you could Google that if you really desperately no, wanted to. Um, I mean, it's good Michigan history. Yeah, why not? Throw it in there. Um. So, so um, the guard it became very quickly apparent exactly whose side the National Guard was on. With them, like, staying in, on company-owned land and being um, fed by the company and creating human shields between the opposing parties during rallies with guns pointed at the union strikers. Was this 1913? Yes. <laughs> it was Woodbridge and Ferris, <coughs> who I assume Ferris State University is named after. You know, probably. Oh, cool. What? From 1917 to 1920, the governor's name was Albert E. Sleeper. Governor Sleeper. Sleeper hold. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, as you were. It's a good name. He it had is. a marketing team. <laughs> yes. Um. So the company also rallied the people in town and um, mine workers that had uh, anti-union sentiments. Um, Calumet and Heckler developed their own opposing party that they called the Citizens Alliance, which is made up of locals and professional strike breakers to, that were hired to do what the National Guard could not. So hundreds of strike breakers came in from Chicago and New York. Most of them were deputized and described as thugs. They were then okay. armed. Uh, and the Citizens Alliance went to the streets, holding counter rallies and generally stirring up shit, throwing rocks, beating strikers, arresting strikers on like bullshit trumped up charges like loitering and intimidation, mm -hmm. even though they had no weapons. Yeah. Can mm -hmm. I throw two of these names at you real quick? Yeah. These governor names. Please. Okay. Our fifth ever governor. Fifth. 1846 to 1847. Alpheus Felch. Ooh. Great name. That sounds like a really dirty sex the, situation. The Alpheus Felch. Uh -huh. Anyway, he had a double star. He resigned to become a U.S. senator. Um, Ugh. So that was 1847. 1848, there was one in between. Who cares? Epaphroditus Ransom. What a fucking name. Epa His mustache has to be beautiful. Epaphroditus. Sir, Ransom. Feed me grapes and tell a me A Democrat pretty. from 1848. I need to Google what Epaphroditus Ransom looks like because he's <laughs> got to be just fucking great. Glorious. His mustache has to be so on point. For the record, Epaphroditus was a saint. Ugh. Epaphroditus never mind. Ransom. He's got a weak jaw. Um, Let's see. <laughs> He died in 1859. Oh, from smallpox? His wife's name was Elmira. <laughs> of course it was. <laughs> right? <laughs> Don't have to laugh at that. This is... um, he. Oh, shoot. He looks like an actor, and I can't think of who it is. 
He was six. Uh, no one cares. Are you going to show me a picture of him or nope, not? Nope. Nope. I'm just going to keep it all to myself. He looks like the guy. Okay. Okay. I'm ready. <clears throat> I don't know his name. Okay. I then know, I won't I know his name. I can't think of it. You you might be able to think of Everyone's it. Everyone's going to be shouting into it. You know, it's the guy that always plays opposite. And so he's always the second in like Talladega Nights and Step Brothers. <gasps> Whatever his name oh is. Oh my god, he's a great actor. He's in oh my yep. gosh, he's the sheriff. Do you see it? Yeah, yes. <laughs> okay. Oh my god, it's not it's a junior. He's a junior. Is he? Oh my gosh, he's in Chicago. <laughs> he's the um I'm glad you can't the, think of the either. Mr. Cellophane should have been my name. Hold on, we're almost Mr. there. Cellophane. John C. Riley. Yes. He's not a junior. <laughs> oh he no, he's not. He's not? Oh. No. He okay. does play a junior in it's the Talladega Knights. Yes. He's Cal Naughton Jr. in mm-hmm. Talladega Knights. Mm-hmm. But he's John C. Riley. Anyway. He's a ama- he's an amazing underrated like actor. Ap- what did I just say? Aphrodisiac Ap- 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 Ransom. <laughs> Ransom. He looks a little John C. Riley esque. I also do not want that man feeding me grapes. He's got jowls. <laughs> <laughs> I lied. Take it all back. <laughs> <laughs> but his name, Epaphroditus, pretty solid. Way to go, Michigan. <laughs> he probably won the election because everyone's like, I'm voting for that guy. Look at that fucking name. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> back to your story. <laughs> back to the story. Back to your poop sticks. Okay. So the strike breakers, uh, they were hired. They were professionals from Chicago and New York. Their sole job was to stir up shit, uh, beating. They have st- sticks for that. They d- <laughs> No, the union workers <laughs> okay, have okay. The, the, the sticks. <laughs> Um, these people had guns instead. They were deputized. Oh, you stick those in an outhouse, it won't have the same effect. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> the spatter, though. <laughs> Instead of blood spatter, it's feces spatters. Yeah, yes. Mm. Mm. Uh, some some gray poupon. <laughs> yes. So um, they would also arrest a lot of the uh, strike breakers on trumped up charges like loitering and intimidation. Citizens arrest. No, these were deputized. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. they they had legal they had legal authority to do so. Mm-hmm. Um, and this was all under the uh, idea that they were that all of these people were saving their neighborhood and their way of life. Oh, good for them. Yes, and they also hired spies. The company did. Okay. Yeah, to to infiltrate the unions. Yes. So as the winter months came and food and the measly twenty three thousand dollars in funds that the union had. Uh, accumulated compared to the one million in liquid assets and the one million in product that Calumet and Hecla had in their funds. Yeah. Uh, once the funds were drowning out, uh, drying out, um, the wives started going back to the bars. No, <laughs> no, no. It was just very sad. They were working. They were um, primarily surviving on like very rare stipends from the unions and also like um, oh, from like back west. Yeah, like, well, because when you join a union, you pay in your funds, and it's there for when um, shit hits the fan and yep. somebody needs backed up. And uh, they also were relying on donations from the community who were pro union. Okay. So, uh, as they were running low and the winter months had set in, Big uh, Big Patty Annie Clemens decided Just to. Just Big Annie. <laughs> Big Annie. It's all very confusing. Yeah. So Big Annie Clemens decided to throw a little Christmas party for the strikers and their family. Okay. So she went around town collecting funds because all she wanted was the kids to at least have an orange to open at Christmas. Like open the orange, like peel? No. Or like put like, the orange here's in a, a present. present. It's fresh fruit. Here, this will help the scurvy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is how desperate. Is this where chocolate were. oranges come from? <gasps> oh my god! <laughs> I bet you it's not. <laughs> no, it is absolutely not. <laughs> okay. Um, so the party was being held on the second floor of the Italian Hall in downtown Calumet on Christmas Eve. So, okay. So there was a feast and a play. Kids were opening their Spaghetti presents. Spaghetti everywhere. Mm-hmm. It's in an Italian hall, I assume. <laughs> Most people at this party were actually Finnish. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, I don't actually know. All that tar-flavored stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. I have no idea what Finns eat. I feel like it'd be a lot of seafood. <laughs> yes. Um, and tar. There's, which there's we learned. out in like What were Michigan. we looking at that was tar-flavored that we were like, what Vodka? the fuck? Yeah, something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then he just went down a rabbit a rabbit hole of like Scandinavians liking tar flavored everything. Yeah. Um, tar from like trees, not like tar from like oil. Correct. Um, yeah. <laughs> specify that. Nope. 
<laughs> they're pretty much the same thing. Yeah, they're like, mm, this asphalt is delicious. Mm. So there was a feast and a play. The kids were opening presents. In total, there was somewhere between 600 to 800 people that had showed up throughout the Holy evening. Mm-hmm. It was described as so busy that it was hard to keep track of who was coming and going. The spies. Worse. Despise. <laughs> yes. So then at approximately 4.40 in the afternoon, after the presents were open and at the height of festivities, a man snuck up the stairs to the second floor and shouted fire twice. Like in a public theater. Yes. This jerk. In English. Okay. W- which is sus because most of these people were Finnish and Italian and yeah. Croatian. Speak in their native tongue. Mm-hmm. Um, and the witnesses afterwards, there are hundreds of people that have watched this man walk up the stairs and shout fire. Witnesses afterwards swear that this man was wearing an anti-union pin on his jacket. Hmm. Imagine that. Yeah. Uh, so pandemonium broke loose. Before anyone could confirm whether they there truly was a fire or not, all 600 plus people sprinted toward their only exit, which was the doors at the bottom of a wide, steep stairwell. Seems like a problem. Mm -hmm. Parents grabbed their children and ran for the exit. One man made it outside, and then the next person tripped at the base of the stairs. Oof. And then another. And then a pile up. Yep. And then more. Until the stairwell was full of a human mass, trying not to be crushed under the weight of the others above them. Just take a deep breath, everyone. (laughs) Sure. sure, sure. (laughs) Um, In total, 73 people died. Holy shit. 60 of them were children. That is ridiculous. Yeah. Like, if you can't see smoke, you're not, like, it's not that much danger. Like, I don't know. That's just crazy. This is why <clears throat> freedom of speech yeah, is limited. has responsibilities <laughs> to it. Yeah. You can't scream fire in a public place like that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, the cause of deaths were asphyxiation. Naturally. Yep. Yep. So the tangle of bodies made it... That's suffocating in a fancy term. It is, yes. So the tangle of bodies made it nearly impossible to pull people from the stairwell. Some managed to get saved, while others were already dead once they pulled them out. Okay. Their bodies were taken just a block away to the Calumet Theater, which was serving as a makeshift morgue. It's terrible. Mm Mm-hmm. Caskets were fast-tracked to Calumet from across the state, There were little white ones for the children and black ones for the adults. The youngest child to die was two. Jesus. Yeah. So other children were He was a real threat to the anti-unioners, so I get it. Yeah. 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 Real vocal about it. Yes. Yeah, that two-year-old just walking around with sticks with shit on them. Yep. Other children were left as orphans. Funerals were held in various churches across the community on December 28th. So... All of these little funeral processions then merged into one uh, procession as men carried the coffins of the children and adults were pulled along by horse-drawn carriages. Okay. This is really going to, I feel like, galvanize the union anyway. Yeah. It does. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Afterwards, people were like, guys. <sighs> yeah. Fuck these assholes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was actually one of the biggest mine-related tragedies in United States history up to that point. And it was loosely mine related it was just mine people yeah they were like mine workers who were trying to have one nice day out of the last like six months of them suffering yeah and being underfed and having no money just trying to get like a safer working conditions There's just because- orange juice everywhere because you got all these guys squished in a ho- in a stairway not funny <laughs> was, too much okay god it smells like oranges in here <laughs> Damn kids get <laughs> one <in> their presents. <laughs> right. So uh, a crowd over 20,000 converged from all over the state to witness the funerals, including over 500 coal miners, coal miners from the UP that came to join the procession. There was a trench dug in the frozen earth to bury the dead, and eulogies were given in Croatian, Italian, and Finnish, because most of those who died were of such. Were Finnish. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So after... Charles Moyer, who was the leader of the union, the WFM. Yep. Um, he went back to his hotel room to send out telegraphs to any government officials that he could think of, pleading for an investigation into the disaster. Tick 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 tick. So word got around to the sheriff that Moyer was sending out these 
telegraphs. Mm-hmm. He then the sheriff then showed up at McMoyer's hotel room with a group of town dignitaries. Oh, how pretentious. <laughs> they have those fancy mustaches. Wigs everywhere. <laughs> and so the sheriff asked loosely, loosely used the word yeah. asked. Heavily suggested. Yes. McMoyer to stop sending out the telegraphs and to issue a statement of exoneration for the Citizens Alliance for any blame in the Italian Hall disaster. I hope that was met with a hearty fuck no. It was. Uh, so bear in mind, the Citizens Alliance was never mentioned by anybody at all about any sort of involvement into this. Mm-hmm. They just wanted somebody to look into what had happened. And so McMoyer said no because he didn't even know what had happened. So he can't exonerate anybody from some sort yeah. of like disaster event. There was even um, there was even a newspaper like a for not a foreign newspaper, but a non English speaking newspaper in Michigan that got told to like cease and desist and threatened to be sued and shut down because like on Ju- on December twenty seventh they had started um, <clears throat> claiming probably rightfully so that uh, what had happened at Italian Hall was murder. Yeah, it definitely. Yeah, there's the some, definitely minimum, someone liable. Yes, yeah. the bare minimum is manslaughter. Mm-hmm. So they got like, they were like, we're going to sue you and take you out. Y'all are going to die if you don't shut the fuck up. Right. Speaking of dying, if you don't shut the fuck up. Um, after McMoyer told the sheriff that he wasn't going to do that and that, and that he had no clue what had happened. And that's why he was asking for help from Congress to yeah. investigate the matter. Uh, the sheriff uh, told McMoyer that if that was the case, then the sheriff could no longer protect him. <laughs> How can we? <laughs> yes. So I didn't realize he was doing such a good job protecting him before that. Oh, it gets better. Uh, the group turned around, left, shut the door. Seconds after they shut the door, there was a knock at his door a second time. Mm-hmm. And in barged a different group of men wearing Citizen Alliance pins. Hmm. Mm-hmm. They promptly beat Mick Moyer and one one man hitting him on the top of the head with a gun, which promptly discharged somehow, shooting Mick Moyer in the back. Huh. Wouldn't you know it? Yeah. It's weird. If you hold your finger on the trigger and hit someone with it, you might pull the trigger. Yeah. It's also curious how, like, I'm pretty sure that if you were to just try to hit somebody with a gun, you use the butt of the gun, right? Probably. So how is the butt of a gun that's facing upward shoot somebody in the back? Well, I mean, if they're already on the ground and you hit him in the head, I mean, maybe your barrel's pointing. I Either suppose. Way, At this point was the they moment. Have guns. They yeah, have guns this, and they're beating him up. Yeah, yeah. This was the point in the, in the documentary that I was watching where I shouted, what? And you were like, are you okay? I'm like, I'm fine. Just give me a minute. Make more, you're not so much. Me, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, so with a bullet lodged inside him, still alive. Mm-hmm. The group of men then dragged McMoyer from his hotel to a nearby bridge. McMoyer fought against them the entire time, even as they held him against the railing in an attempt to throw him over. Okay. He fought hard enough that the group abandoned the attempt to uh, the attempted murder and decided to just chuck him on a train back to Chicago instead. <laughs> so, okay. So McMoyer showed up in Chicago had emergency surgery, and then contacted the union heads who in turn contacted Congress the very next day. Okay. Um, So Congress did wind up going up north to Michigan in the dead of winter, and they conducted an inquiry, gathered over a thousand interviews, and forced both sides, the strikers and Calumet and Hecla, Mm -hmm. to sit down to mitigate. Okay. McNaughton, the head of of, uh, Calumet and and Hecla, uh, still refused to come to any denial is powerful mm-hmm. he, uh, saying essentially I that I don't hear you no. <laughs> yeah he uh, he essentially said that he didn't negotiate his billfold with anyone okay so if his money comes into question he's not going to negotiate it with anybody their money on the other hand fuck you guys right yeah by April 1914 all hope was finally lost the union gathered and voted to end the strike and go back to work at this point, many had left northern Michigan to find better and safer work, most going to the Ford plant in southern Michigan. Okay. Yep. They were probably booming at the time. Yeah. And you had eight-hour work days and got paid better, better money and you were just on an assembly line. Yeah. Like, you weren't going to die. You weren't 7,000 feet under the earth. <laughs> yes. Um, so, only half of the workers were given their jobs back. 
Uh, Calumet and Hecla did shorten their work days to eight hours and gave them a slight pay raise, but like not because the workers had striked, simply because the company was feeling nice. Oh, how generous. <laughs> I appreciate it. Right? <laughs> so on top of their slight pay raise, uh, the union was ordered to disband and then workers were docked five cents a day from their pay to gift a watch to James McNaughton as a thank you for preventing the WFM from taking over. <laughs> What a fucking dick move. <laughs> oh, it gets better. Okay. Um, it was inscribed with, due to your unyielding compromise, we are free of the affliction of the WFM. It's the ultimate What a gas- hero. <laughs> yeah, it's the ultimate gaslighting. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it would be another decade before any type of organizing would happen again. And the last copper mine in, in the UP was that was shut down was in Calumet. Uh, in 1968, and it was the Calumet and Hecla Mining Company from a strike. Okay. So it took until 1968. 60 years later, yeah. Yeah, to finally come to an end. Wow. And that is the Italian Hall disaster and the events that led up to it. I, I didn't think, I assume there was death because you wrote a paper. Mm-hmm. I didn't think it was going to be from a pile of Finnish immigrants in an Italian hall stairway on Christmas. Like that's just not where I saw this going. Mm-mm. Like I assumed it was going to be some sort of, like I obviously there's mining deaths like one mm-hmm. a week, but like I assumed like the the way this all ended was going to be some mass tragedy mine related, not Christmas related. Mm-hmm. I thought it would be a good start to the Christmas season. Oh, Perfect. I mean, I'm so full of festive cheer. Would you like me to do the coal miners battle that happened in West Virginia next? <gasps> no. They brought Gatling guns in with horses. Did they? Mm-hmm. That's fun. The United States government. Like a the it Gatling a, gun attached to a horse? They were pulled by horses. Oh, okay. Like big boxes of Gatling I guns. I was just hoping it was a soldier like had a giant gat. Like that would scare no, the shit out the of the ones horse, that right? were. Those were the ones that were like... They had soldiers in the mountains sniping off people. Like oh, this yeah, was yeah. like an actual literal battle. Yeah, it was you, the biggest insurrection in the United States history. I thought that, that might come up in this yeah. time, this mm-hmm. one, but no. The same time period, it was when people were fighting for like you know mm-hmm. better. No, no, rights. I'm, I'm depressed enough after this one. <laughs> you don't want to hear about an actual battle. No, this has got orange juice kids written all over. That's <laughs> so sad. <laughs> it's really sad. All they wanted was fresh fruit, and they were freshly squeezed. No, no. Okay, sorry you you brought up dead Finnish children. I don't know what you want me to do. I'm supposed to make jokes. You gave me nothing but horrible <laughs> things to joke about. It is it is it is super sad. It though. is. Like I don't I feel like we should have come up with some sort of like Finnish drink. I said we had gin for this one. I don't actually know where gin comes from. This gin came from Scotland. Hey, there's Scottish in this. They there were is. skilled workers. Yeah. They didn't die. I mean, they probably died we in the mines. We could have done vodka. That seems to be like... Yeah, get some Svedka. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I don't think that's Finnish. Seems it's sw- Scandinavian. It's close enough. Yeah. Anyway. No, do you have... Uh, I see you have sources written <laughs> down. I do. Did you want to go over those? I suppose. Or do you want me to edit those on to the end? We haven't had to do that in a while. No, no. I haven't forgot sources in a while. Uh, so I used an MLive article called uh, 1913 Italian Hall Disaster Was a Michigan Christmas Eve Tragedy. And then I found a segment on michiganradio.org interviewing Steve Latto, who was the great grandson of. I was gonna say, you said that name. Okay. I was like, I yeah. don't know who that is. He was the great grandson of uh, someone who was in the disaster. Um, so his grandmother was there and his two great aunts. And so his dad scooped up all three kids and headed down the stairwells and literally yeeted them out to try to get them out. <laughs> One of them died. She was 10 years old. Her name was Lydia. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah. I thought I'd give you a name. I know you like that. Oh, yeah. I love when you make it super personal. <laughs> yep. Um, so that article with that like 17 minute like radio interview mm-hmm. uh, was named Rem- Remembering One of the Biggest Tragedies in Michigan 100 Years Later. And then lastly, I found a PBS doc titled Red Metal, which was based off of Steve Lado's book. Oh, okay. And those are my sources. Terrific. And that was the Italian Hall disaster. It was. Happy Christmas, guys. Happy Christmas, Harry. Enjoy your chocolate oranges. <laughs> Yes. All right. And if you just finished listening to this, now you, go to Patreon and listen to the bonus episode. Yep. And if you've made it this far. Congrats. We appreciate the heck out of it. We do. Yep. 
and we're going to start a GoFundMe for a third mic. Just kidding. <laughs> but if you are a Patreon, we also do bonus episodes with our patrons. To get us that third mic. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Shamelessly plug that shit. Mm-hmm. But no, we've done it with what? Now three of our patrons? Yeah. Yeah. So, and we have tentative plans for a fourth. Yep. That's why the third mic talks have started. Yes. Because not everyone wants to Zoom. Some people want to be like In here person. with us. Which, if you know us, is way easier. If you're a stranger Patreon, it would take some like vetting out yeah. before we're like, sure, come over to our house. <laughs> That's normal. <laughs> no, that might have to be Zoom only. Sorry, yeah, guys. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. It had Scott's to be like, a good cook, but it's not that good. <laughs> But yeah, and our dog's not going to defend us if you're a psycho. <laughs> Absolutely she's not. She's 12 pounds of nothing. <laughs> anyway. She's 12 pounds of heavy sighing. <laughs> yes. Anyway, thanks for listening. Enjoy your December. When's this coming out? 29th? Almost. Hopefully you had a good Thanksgiving. Yeah. Hang some Christmas lights. Drink all the booze. Try the Hendrix Lunar Gin. It's very strong. <laughs> very strong. <laughs> very strong. All right. Uh, goodbye. Okay, Bye. Thanks for listening to our terrible podcast. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or wherever you like to listen. Feel free to follow us on Twitter at TMSTPod. And if you'd like to support the show, you can find us on Patreon at Tell Me Something Terrible. Oof, that was terrible.